right, well, good morning to you. Good to see you. Welcome to Church for the City, where you will encounter the reality and the presence of the Almighty God. It's so good to be in the house. We'll give a shout out to the online campus. Let them know that we're so grateful for them. Let's come on, give them a shout out. All right, um, let me hit a few things kind of uh, quickly, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the message and what's happening with that. Uh, I want to do, there's a group, and well, did I, did I say Happy Mother's Day? No, okay, no, sorry. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms. God bless you. You are amazing. On that note, we have a group here called uh, Moms Mentoring Moms. Uh, it's led by uh, Araceli Ortiz, uh, Lisa Henderson, I think also there'll be uh, another one. They, they started the group for women that wanted to Go, go, deep in, go deep in the word and also to have community. It's a discipleship group, a support group. Uh, it's, it's an outstanding group. The reports that we get uh, from the ladies, I actually have a few <clears throat> and some of the things they wrote. Uh, uh, Andrea Costa said, Mom's Mentoring Mom's Group has been vital to my spiritual growth. The community and encouragement I've been blessed with is priceless. Our hunger for God is beautiful and learning from each other is just so special because we start to gain better or different perspectives to the approach of scripture. Love that. Uh, Jocelyn Ed said the Moms Mentoring Moms group has allowed me to build a community within the church that consists of women who are going through the same stage of life and have been supportive and encouraging. I'm grateful for, for Ari, for Lisa, and for the CTC church family for providing the resources. Emily West says, Moms Mentoring Moms has blessed my life with new friendships, learning about the Bible on a deep level and seeing firsthand what prayer can do for a person. So Moms Mentoring Mom, you can go on the website. You can uh, get the information on that. They can also help you at the connect table. But if you're looking for a community group as a mother where you can grow, where you got moms in the same stage of life as you have heard, uh, please come on and, and, uh, and, and jump on uh, jump on into that. Anybody needs a seat? I always got seats next to me. Just come on up. Um, let me, uh, another thing about family, uh, Gabriel and Jolene Morales do a family CLG, which is outstanding. You're going to see some pictures here, and I think the material that they just uh, finished using. I want to thank them for investing in families and just meeting with them, pouring out into them. Uh, just uh, pretty amazing. Uh, one of the things that we're doing, again, all, all because of growth, is, um, okay, that's something else on the screen that I'm seeing, but it's okay. You can, you can uh, I'm off script, people, sorry. Um, so because of the growth that we, we're gonna have to make, make space for the two-year-olds with on their own and three-year-olds on their own, not on their own. I mean, they got adults in there, but yeah, yeah, we, we don't want to leave them by themselves. Yeah, that would, wow, that would really turn a church upside down. But uh, so, but if you're, if you're interested in helping with us with, with children's ministry, that's an area where we really, uh, we, we really do need some help. And it's some of the most formidable years of their life. So if you have a heart just to serve, um, you know, we don't ask you for blood. We don't ask you for a whole life commitment. Uh, we just ask you to be faithful with what you can do, and it will help us continue to serve uh, our children. I do want to thank Gabriel and Jolene for that. Your generosity uh, is amazing with the things that you uh, help us do in our church through your giving is over the top. We had a group that joined with Christ Lutheran yesterday to do Feed My Starving Children. Those you'll see uh, pictures of rolling. Uh, I know the group that we had from 2 o'clock, sorry, 12 o'clock to two, to, two, to 2 o'clock, done like almost 28,000 pounds of food, which is going to feed uh, 76 children for a whole year. I think there was another group that came behind us, I believe, uh, that Renee Camaro led at 2.30. But I want to thank all of you again. Generosity, this cost Christ Lutheran about 30000 to do. Uh, we wanted to partner with them and along with other people in the community. But just thank you again for your generosity and your, and your desire to, to be a blessing over and beyond uh, our own local assembly. With that in mind, I do want to pray. We always pray for other local churches. 
asking God to help them. So just bow your heads with me for just a moment. Father, I want to thank you for your goodness, for your graciousness. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to be part of a great community, a great church, a great church family. Uh, it's, it's my desire, Lord God, that the things that are communicated today, which is primarily geared toward mothers, uh, Lord, does minister to them. I certainly want to decrease that you might increase. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. I pray my tongue is like the tongue of a ready writer that speaks things, Lord God, that brings life. It's like apples of gold. And so I pray for your grace, pray for your anointing. Lord, I do pray for uh, uh, Christ Lutheran. I'll pray for this morning, Pastor Vince, his, his family, Lord, the church great church in our city, great man, actually. I thank you for all the things that he's done uh, throughout the years, almost 30 years, uh, himself being a pastor here in Yuma. Continue to bless them to do a great work. Pray those that are recipients of the work that was done yesterday will be ever blessed and grateful. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to ask you to stand if you would. We're going to go to Philippians chapter 3 because it is Mother's Day. I'm going to take a slight break. Uh, from Kings, the next message in Kings is actually killing a bunch of folks. I didn't think it would be appropriate <laughs> for Mother's Day. We'll save that uh, after you get your flowers, your, you know, donuts and strawberries dipped in chocolate and all of that stuff, and then we'll, we'll get back to killing next week. All right, uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 8, 9, and 10. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death. So far, the reading of the word, you may be seated. It's going to be a stretch to some degree for me to apply these passages on where I'm going ultimately with this message that does reflect. The topic of this message is, is motherhood today. Let's talk motherhood today. I will, I will tell you that th there has been a host of people that's uh, been involved in this message. I, I think I began initially with my lead team and received a lot of thoughts and, and um, just expressions from people in the room then, uh, parents, mom and, and dads. And then I also have a content team that I meet with on Wednesday mornings. We meet for an hour. I bring my thoughts for the sermon, the outline, the scriptures, etc. And then they kind of speak to me on various ways that uh, on how it may be best to communicate that, different ideas. The other thing that I did though this time was I sent out a questionnaire uh, to probably about 25 mothers uh, with three questions. One was, uh, I believe the most challenging thing that mothers are facing today. The second question was, what are things that mothers deal with today that probably was not an issue 15 years ago? And the third thing is, what is the prayer, your, your most primary prayer for your children, and how do you live that, that out? And so there's going to, this today, uh, which I normally would not do, I'm going to quote different uh, people from our church and things that they said, because some of the things they said, I could not say uh, better. They know that I'm quoting them. As a matter of fact, all of them have received a copy of the sermon and I, I want to say this, I, I actually would lo love for every mother in here uh, to get the whole transcript of the sermon. If you send me an email at pastortyrone at ctcfamily.com, not only will I send you the transcript, and I'll get that to you right away, but I do have a gift uh, that I want all mothers to receive. So if you send that email, send me your address, and that gift will get directly uh, ship to you. That's at Pastor Tyrone. Tyrone with an E on the end, please. Pastor Tyrone at ctcfamily.com. Uh, I'm tired of going, people calling me Tyrone. It's Tyrone, people. <laughs> Tyrone with an E on the end. All right. Um, now, I just, for a moment, uh, just want you to just to think about a few things 
that have changed. Uh, I certainly know when I was growing up, I, I could play outside without my grandparents having to worry about anything. Could ride my bike anywhere, play, uh, play outside. I used to look forward. It was special to be able to look at cartoons on Saturday morning, right? That was a, that was a, a, a special thing. Um, parents actually took pictures and got them developed, <laughs> right? And not just carry them on your phone. Uh, oh, let me show you, Johnny. Let me show you. know, uh, you actually had pictures to uh, develop. The only way to speak to each other in the house was to talk to them, right? Not text them, <laughs> you know. Even though they're in the same house, we wrote letters. Uh, when we went on flights or was in the cars uh, or went out to dinner, we weren't given iPads to keep us distracted. Parents actually read the newspaper, and there was something in your house that actually rang when somebody wanted to talk to you called a telephone. I think now this generation, if they were in the house and heard a phone ring, they would have thought it was a fire alarm. But, uh, but there was actually something that actually rang. So a lot of things have changed, of course, uh, over the years. And I think some of that has actually been the challenges uh, that mothers face. I don't think I need to tell you uh, that, that motherhood is hard work. And that saying that motherhood is hard work, period, should be enough. It's, uh, it can be grueling. Uh, emotionally, it can, be, it can be tough, it can be uh, exhausting. And that just deals with the acts of being a mother, just what it takes to be a mom. And then I think people just, a lot of mothers have some private stuff uh, that they deal with once they become uh, a mother. Friendships change or they, they weaken because you're in a different stage of life. You were with your single friends or, non, or friends who did not have children, and then when you have one, then... Those friendships may change a bit. Play dates uh, may get a little bit off because not all the time will your child cooperate with play date time and nap time or time to feed them. And, and so that can, that can challenge some, some community groups. Relationships even with, with your husband may change affectionately and relationally. Even when you come to church, things may change a little bit because sometimes you're sitting on edge doing the church service nervous that your number is going to come up on the screen because there's a desperate child care worker who needs help, right? And so, so that changes. But, there, there's, but there's some other things now uh, that I think have really become the new baby monitor of life, things that you have to be alarmed to and alert to uh, that you have to keep uh, an eye on. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive into into those and break some of those down. I can't deal with, with everything. Some of this is real common. Actually, probably the way I'm going to do this sermon would not be normally orthodox. But, but one of the things that was probably the primary thing that everybody responded to that was more difficult now as a mother than it ever has been is navigating through social media. Navigating social media, the access of it, the degree of difficulty of trying to control that with your child, uh, and the effect. And I want to say this, even though I'm talking to moms primarily, uh, dads, please, uh, you, you're in on this. You need to listen up. And just already remember this, no matter how much I say about moms, Father's Day is coming. So don't sit up there and act like, you know, you're going to get stark free on everything. But, but, uh, but just navigating through social media, uh, Amanda Mellon, she, she, this was an excellent statement. She said, social media and technology are at the fingerprints of every child and teen, coupled with the anti-Bible agendas regarding sex, sexual identity, abortion, marriage, and an attack on traditional worldview has created a cesspool, which is informing our kids on how to think. This statement I thought was great. When I began raising my firstborn years ago, never in my wildest dreams did I thought I'd have to fight the roaring lion that could slickly sneak into my home, home while my teenager was sitting safely beside me on the couch. Aside from all of that, kids now have each other's locations available to them at all times. They can see when their friends are gathering without them, which just continues the cycle of comparison and rejection again and again. No wonder we have to battle depression and anxiety on a level that we don't understand. How many people can relate to that? <clears throat> it's, a, it's, a, it's a fact. <clears throat> the problem is, it's not just a child problem. 
It's not just a proud child problem. Lupe Rojas said this, many mothers have a phone glued to their hands. They become addicted to social media, so even when they're with their children, they really aren't. And so, because we have computers, because we have iPads, and they got to use those in school, it's, it's obvious that you can't absolutely control things that, that is either out of your arena or when they're out of your sight. Nothing uh, is foolproof, and I, I get that. They can get into stuff without you being uh, present. But know this, as a parent, you have all right to monitor and access anything they have. As long as they're in your house, as long as they're breathing the air that you let them breathe in that house and sit at the table and get to drink the water that you're paying for and the food from the chicken that you just killed, they got every, you got every right to monitor that. There's, there is no such thing. I'm sorry, uh, teenagers, if you don't like this, you got no right to say to your parents, it's my right. I want my privacy. I told you about the kid last week who the, yeah, I think, yeah, that's good preaching, Pastor. Good preaching right there. Good preaching. I told you about the child last week when the doctor couldn't get the six-year-old to open her mouth so he could check her and have her say, ah, and the mother said, it's her body, her right. Come on now. Uh, No, no, no. You, You got a right to access everything that your children have. And Oftentimes, I know with younger children, you know, parents are trying to determine, you know, who you give access, when you give them access, and, and, uh, and how, you, how you do that, what age should a child have a cell phone, uh, et cetera. I, I, the simple thing for me is you control the distribution. You control that. You don't let society control that. You don't let uh, the overwhelming thought of the child saying, you know, Sally got the cell phone, Johnny got the cell phone, they got this, they, that, that's on you as a parent. You make that decision. It's not a matter about age appropriation. It's about the decision that you want to make on who you want to let disciple your children. You can, you can do things with access, you can do things where you, you block some things off, but, but I'm, I'm telling you right now, just know this. The moment you give them this, you have just allowed thousands of people into their life. Thousands into their life. And you got to make a determination, am I ready and do I want to do that? It's not a matter of age. It's not a matter of maturity. It's a matter of who you want to have access to your child. And don't fool yourself. Now, I'm pretty passionate about this. But I promised to act right. I promised. But listen, listen, let me tell you something. Fentanyl, they say, doctors say, can have some good if it's done in the right manner. There is some good that can come from ha- letting your child have a cell phone, access, blah, blah, blah. I don't, I don't know. But don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself. Even with fentanyl. If, they, if it's done wrong, mixed up, all of that kind of stuff, you know as well as I do, it'll kill people. Don't think that you can give your child a drug and say to them, I know you're smart enough to control that drug. Remember, fentanyl is bad for you, but you're my child. You're smart enough to cut it in half. Don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself. Y'all doing all right? Don't, don't, don't fool yourself. I'm telling you, this is when I think it's a good time to give any child a a cell phone. When you see them carrying the Bible more than this, then you're on the right track. You're on the right track. And so it's not a matter of appropriateness. It's a matter of you determine when you believe your child is discipled enough that you're not concerned about what affects them from there. It's it's. You got to be the gatekeeper. You got to be the gatekeeper of the child's heart, the child's mind, and the child's spirit. I'll quote uh, Amanda again. We have to guard the gates and push back the darkness like never before. We have to not only be wise as serpents, as innocent as doves for what we can see, but we have to push back the darkness of all that we do not see. Among the many blessings of technology, we have to also navigate the dangers and the impending attack on our kids, innocence, mindsets, belief systems, core values, and self-worth. 
because the messages are receiving on the message they're receiving on a daily while just trying to complete homework on their computers are not largely life-giving. Rather, they seek to confuse, manipulate, distort, trick, and accuse them in secret places of their heart. Absolute truth. So just a couple of things on that, and I'll move on to the next thing. Just be sober and vigilant. Sober means to have the right mind about this. Be clear, be alert, and be vigilant. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, uh, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And so all of our children are certainly vulnerable and can be praised. The second thing on that is to help them put on the armor of God. I think that's the, best, that's the best remedy. Arm your children or help them arm themselves with the armor of God every morning. Look at what the armor of God does for us. Ephesians 6, 11 through 17. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. I don't think I need to convince you. The devil does have a strategy, and he's on it every day. And listen, the devil is not the type of person that's going to come to you and say, listen, mommy, listen, daddy, today is the day I'm going to attack your child. No, no, no. He's on the alert all, I mean, sorry, he's on the charge all the time. Stand firm against the enemies, for we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore... Put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground. Put on the belt of truth. That's arming them with the truth, the word of God, God's righteousness, informing them of who they are in Christ Jesus. For shoes put on peace that comes from the good news, making sure they understand the gospel. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith. Standing firm in their faith, they can stop the arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet. Know that you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ and take on the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So how you make these determinations and decisions, just know social media is not always your friend. Social media is not always a friend of your child. Access to all that is not always their friend. And so be be sober, be vigilant, and help them put on the armor of God. If you say amen, I'll hit the next thing. Number two, stuff that leads to unbiblical indoctrination of children, including that which erodes or redefines values and morals that oppose Scripture, was another one of the things that came up as one of the biggest concerns. Of course, some of that, again, comes through what they have uh, through access. Uh, But again, mothers, again, you, you got a critical responsibility. Again, I'm not leaving dads out of this at all. Uh, but to be the moral compass, uh, equipping your children to uh, navigate through all of the social stuff, the society stuff, uh, the stuff that's, that's uh, destroying Christian values, helping them to navigate, th- navigate through that. And again, if you don't disciple your children, somebody else will. Uh, it, it's either going to be friends, it could be other family members, it could be music, it could be media, it could be movies. You can't trust everything that comes out of Disney these days, as you well know. Uh, You can have blockers on. You can have things that let you know on whatever they're watching or listening to that sends you a a notice about that. Uh, I think it was uh, Jake Miller in our content meeting that says they have various blocks and parameters on their uh, children's stuff. I think it was Tyrone who said that him and Karina watch movies all the way through before they... Uh, let their children watch them. There's just things that you can do to be careful of that. But ultimately, of course, discipleship is the Word of God. That's the best method. That's the best method to teach your children. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says this, all Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. That's not just for adults. That's also for our children. It's training them, teaching them the word of God, helping them understand the things that we know uh, about our God and the word. Sandra Lerma says, the biggest cultural challenge I see for mothers today is how the culture is constantly trying to tell mothers how to raise their children and all the competing voices for the children's attention. The world standards are... And God's standards are polar opposite. 
If mothers aren't rooted and prayed up, they will fall for the cultural lies. The best and only instruction book we have as mothers is the Bible. Absolutely agree. And it's a lifelong commitment. When, you, when we do dedications, I say it every time, remember the dedication is not for the child. More than likely, the child is not even going to remember the dedication, depending on their age. It's for the parent. It's actually the parent that's standing up here saying, I do. Will you raise your children according to the word of God? I do. Will you walk them in the ways of righteousness? I do. Will you teach them the ways of God? I do. It's the parents that makes that commitment. And it's a, it's a lifelong uh, commitment. Children are at school, could be up to seven hours a day. And on an average, parents have, I'm not talking about in passing, I'm not talking about uh, as we're doing things, but on average, parents have a eight-minute conversation face-to-face -face with their children about nothing but attention on them. On an average, eight minutes a day, and yet they're somewhere else for seven hours a day. You got a big job, and that job is to constantly be discipling. Are y'all doing all right? Now, that does bring the question, uh, you know, parents face about where to place your children for education. I'll I'm just going to deal with that just briefly. Uh, I do know the Bible says that the responsibility for the teaching of the child, uh, is, it, it belongs to the parent. There wasn't a public school or private school, at least in my research, till somewhere in the 1600s. I could have missed some study on that, but um, somewhere around the 1600s hundreds or so is when schools where people could actually take their schools. Before then, it was personal training at home or tutoring uh, or whatever. I, I, I'm not going to tell you. The Bible doesn't tell any parent that they should homeschool or they can't put their children in, in school, whether it be public or private, so I'm not going to go down that route. There, there are choices. I think you need to seek God about all of them whether it be public, whether it be private, whether it be charter, whether it be homeschooling. Again, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I will tell you this, though. Ultimately, the responsibility for their education, not necessarily you educating. Listen, if I, which I did, uh, and, and it's probably some of the worst seasons of some of my children's life when I tried to homeschool them. I can't even speak English. <laughs> so all they came out of it was Ebonics. But I've done the best I could. So it's not a matter of you having to be the one to teach them, but you're responsible for what they are taught. You're responsible for the education. So, so start with the responsibility and ask God for wisdom and guidance and the courage to act upon whatever God directs. Uh, parents should have a say, wherever at school your children are at, parents should have a say in the education, not what they can tell the schools what to teach. I'm talking about having a say and what, what they are taught, how you can manage that, monitor that, uh, et cetera. If there's curriculum that is questionable, then I think parents have a right and responsibility to make a determination of that. We have some outstanding people in this church, in this community, that are outstanding Christian people in public schools, and I thank God that they're there. I thank God that they're there. I thank God that they're a witness. I thank God that they are doing what God has placed them to do and called them to do. And so... So with public schools or even private schools, I think it's a matter of you knowing what's happening. And any place where they can't tell you certain things, if Johnny decides that Johnny wants to transition and it's, it's something that teachers or administrators can't tell a parent, then that probably won't be the safest place for your, for your child. You, you got to be responsible. Shana Stuckey sent me a story that I thought was wonderful. She said, I was doing my oldest daughter's hair before taking her to preschool for the day. As we discussed the day ahead, she asked, Mommy, did you know you can have two mommies and two daddies? In response, I asked, where did you hear that? She replied, in a book at school. When I called the school, the administrator was delighted to confirm my daughter's statement. He went on to say that they read books about homosexual families to the preschoolers. The administrator also, now 
Shauna and her husband, it's an interracial couple. The administrator also pointed out that they had books about interracial marriages and even people with black hair thought that that would impress her. I was furious. I had no idea that this was included in the curriculum. To make matters worse, when I picked my daughters up from school later that day, the administrator told me they were planting seeds. I angrily replied, why don't you plant math, English, and science? <laughs> Our daughters was removed from that school on that very date, and we've been on high alert ever since. And so, so that's, that's the issue. You're responsible for their education. So be wise, be invested, be involved, and be in the know. Can you say amen? All right. Uh, let's talk about gender uh, confusion. And that's exactly what it is, is confusion. I think we can set the record straight on that. Uh, Jeannie Sopizio, there is an absolute outright attack on our children when it comes to their gender and sexuality in today's culture world. From pornographic, pornographic books in our public school libraries to drag queen shows preying on our most vulnerable, innocent, in an effort to indoctrinate them at an early age, evil is present. Now more than ever, we're called upon to protect our children from these new norms and stay vigilant in the fight against our culture and what the world perceives to be progress. I thought that was a great quote. And so bottom line on this, obviously, children are what they were created by God to be. I mean, that's just as simple as, as simple can be. Science is not the determinator, n not, not at all. Your emotions, your feelings are not a determinator. It doesn't matter how many times I like to sing that song out loud, I feel like a woman. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. And your gender expression is not a determinator. I don't care if all of her life, all she did was want to play Tonka trucks and bully people over or bowl people over in football. A girl's a girl. And a boy's a boy. And that's easily to be identified from birth. Genesis 1:27. so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. I mean, that's just, that's just plain and simple. I got an interview coming up, or, or was going to have an interview coming up, and a person was sending me uh, what the interview was going to be about. It's something about the health industry and done by U of A, and at the end of it, the person was explaining the pronouns they like to be called by with a, and I replied back to that and said, okay, now I'm a little, I don't understand why you put this on the end. I didn't ask the person, are you a male or female? I just said, why did you put this long paragraph about the pronouns you like to be called by? The person responded and said, Pastor Jones, I'm so glad you asked that. I'm very, very excited to be able to explain that to you and explain this situation and then attach the sheet defining that if for some reason or another I did not call that person by the pronoun they decided, then they would be very offended and would want to end the interview. I said, okay, that's real easy. We ain't doing no interview. Yeah. So in, in, in the story, that, that's, that's real easy. You can manipulate and disfigure yourself, but it does not change the fact. It only creates confusion and chaos. Just stay good and healthy and be who God created you to be. Good and healthy and who God created you to be. As far as I know, women only are mothers, and only mothers are women. Some of y'all missed that. Genesis 3.20. Then the man, Adam, named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live. And so parents, mothers, you got to deal with this gender confusion stuff because they're dealing with it every day in school. But again, stick to the word of God. Stick to the word of God. Okay, if you give me a good amen, I'll go to the next one. Amen. Oh, you're doing great. You're doing good. All right. So here's the last one I'll deal with in, uh, you know, more in a broad sense, and that's the one of uh, the mother who's working outside of the home and the, the tension and the pressure and even just the whole uh, I idea that what comes with that. 
And, uh, and I know there are. There are a lot of women. Uh, I think it was Tyrone that brought us a t- statistic uh, that in 1966, 13.9% of women worked outside of the home. In 2013, 53.2% of women worked outside of the home. And it's probably more uh, mothers, I should say. Sorry, mothers. And it's the, that was 10 years ago. The number is probably higher, higher than that. Uh, again, I, I am not going to tell you that the Bible tells you whether a mother should, can work outside of the home or not. Again, mother's responsibilities are clear in the scripture uh, of what your role is as a mother to your children and unto the, to the home. Some people are a- able to balance that out uh, very well. I will say, though, that if you're a mother who desires to be home with your children and you're working outside of the home because of either poor financial management or because of debt, or because there's things that you want, I'm just going to say that needs to be addressed. That needs, well, I can hear rat licking ice. Man, it got so doggone quiet in here. That, that needs to be addressed. Uh, it, it really does. No, no, no family should be under that kind of financial pressure. Uh, now, if there's, if there's not enough provision, okay, hey, then I get that. We pray about that. You pray about that. And I'm just going to say it, husbands, men, if, 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 you, if there's not enough provision where if your wife wants to stay home with the children to raise the children, I'm going to tell you, you get a second job or a third job. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, you, now, if you're in that condition because of poor financial management, we can help with that. If you're in that situation with debt, there are things that can help you get out of debt. I don't believe a woman, a mother, should have to work who wants to raise her children because of there's decisions that's been made that's not conducive for the family and the heart of a mother. That's probably as worse as it's going to get for right now. So if you can handle that, we're on the right track. Y'all good still? Now, many of you do it, be, you know, again, because, of, because you, you have to. If you're a working mother outside of the home and you don't have to but you want to, again, there's no biblical creed. Uh, against that as long as you can handle what the scripture tells you what a mother uh, should do. I I do think the Holy Spirit should be your guide. I also think it's always good for a mother to be able to stop working whenever she wants and stay home and take care of the children. Always, yeah. I want to, I think I got a picture. Uh, Can we put a picture up? I'm sorry, I can't remember the little fella's name. Leo, that's right. It's probably right in there. Somebody sent this to me. This is uh, Kelsey. I don't, uh, Kelsey Ramos. Ramos. She may be here, may not be, but somebody sent that to me. I don't know if you can read it, and I actually didn't write it down. Can you read it? Yeah. Yeah, you can see it. It's it's bigger. It's bigger up there. Yeah. Can't you see it? Yeah. Oh, you can't read it. Okay, let me read it. Uh, It says, usually I'm working by now. Some delays are filled with system, some days are filled with System technical issues, many can get tight in these cases. Money can get tight in these cases, but I don't stress. I see the silver lining opportunity to spend much needed quality time with Leo. The life I dreamed I'd have when I had this kid was never to be a working mom. I still don't want to be. My heart longs for the day I can be a full-time mom and stay home. But in the meantime, I soak up every minute with this child. That's the heart. I think of a working mother that doesn't want to, uh, to be working. Marquia says, when I'm walking in God's will over my life, I just want to be a mom. I want to nurture. I want to be home raising my babies. It's who God created me to be. It's something that exists within me. It's who I am. I am a mother. I desire only what God created for me to be. And so, again, I'm not, there's no hard, fast rule in the Scripture, and, and again, not trying to, to make any, but, but I do pray that God helps you to pursue where your heart is and that you can work that out so that you can be who God has, one of the purposes that God has for you. All right, uh, I, got, um, uh, I got five more things that I'm just going to give you real quickly, and then I'm going to kind of turn the page. Y'all still doing all right? Yeah. Uh, okay, more amens will kind of get me going, but it's, if, you, if, you, you know, if you're getting offended and holding back the amens, well, this could take a while. But so here we go. Let me just give you just five quick points. I can't go into details uh, on each of these, but one of them is pay attention to your child's spirit. 
pay attention to your child's spirit. Desiree wrote this. I think it's great. Mental health crisis in children have seemingly become more predominant now. Kids live in such volatile times, they're struggling with their identities, learning how to process complex emotions, and seem to be more vulnerable to depression at younger ages. It forces moms to be on high alert and super attentive to psychological behavioral signs and influences that should be addressed early. I think that's the truth. Be, keep, a, keep a good eye on your child's uh, spirit. It, we see it over and over again. When, when we see when young people have went awry, whether it be, unfortunately, some kind of school shooting or some kind of uh, acts, you usually find out that there were signs that were shown long before that. And sometimes we just pay attention. And remember what I say, don't ever go with the mindset, I see that in Sally now or Billy now, but they'll grow out of it. No, they don't grow out of it, they grow up with it. So just keep an eye on that stuff. Number two, women, this one's gonna be hard for you, but hold on, buckle up. Avoid the effect of the curse on Eve. Do you know part of the curse on Eve in 316 Uh, Genesis 3.16 is this, you will desire to control your husband. Baby, you, now come on, I need some help over here. I, I need some help, right? You will desire to control your husband. Don't, <laughs> I, I, it's, it's not really men I should hear from right now. <laughs> that, that, that's probably not going to go good for you when this service is over. You better come to my office and have some refreshments between services. I'll take you home. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but, but, but hear me though, women, don't usurp the place and authority over your husband. Allow him to be who God has made him to be. And if he's not there yet, you pray that he gets there and you encourage him to get there. But don't desire to control your husband. Number three, develop friendships and mentors with older, seasoned, proven, godly women. They're all over this congregation. We're a multi-generational congregation. There is godly women all over this place who can help you in the process. Titus 2, 4 through 5 says, These older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely and to be pure, to work in their homes, to do good, and to be submissive to their husbands. Listen to this. Talking about the younger women's, when you let older, women's, older women do this, then they will not bring shame on the word of God. So allow, allow yourself to be developed. Number four, this is, this is a tough one, probably my, maybe a little bit out of my league uh, now, uh, but only purchase clothes for your daughter that reflects modesty and do not let her go out of the house looking otherwise. Amen. I mean, my goodness. Some of these young ladies, when they come out of the house, I mean, I even see them around here at the church. I just, come on now, just, you don't need to help them expose anything that nobody should be seeing. I mean, that, I don't even know how else to say that. You don't need to help them do that. It's not cute. Now I'm getting mad. It's not cute. It's not cute. It shouldn't be cute to you. It's not cute for them. Let them grow up with their clothes on, for Pete's sake. Marquia said this, as a mother who's raising daughters and a son, modesty and sexualizing young children has been something new to navigate through. Finding a shirt for my eight-year-old daughter that is not a crop top is a challenge that I'm facing, and I, I know it'll just get harder as she get older. All right, number five, I know I keep saying that this is the last thing, and this, I'll say it again, this is the last thing, and then, I'll, and then I'll get on with it. Number five, let your boys grow up to be men. Let your boys grow up to be men. Uh, I, I, yeah, again, I'll, I'll quote Marquis. As a mother of a son, I think a challenge we now must navigate through today is defining to our boys what a man is. I love this statement. Society has created the image of masculinity to be toxic behavior. And that's a fact, which is creating young boys growing up questioning their identity. So let your boys grow up to be men. All right. Um, okay, I'm almost, I'm almost done. Give me an amen. amen. <clears throat> Pretty good preaching, I think, so far. 
Pretty good. <clears throat> so, so listen, uh, here, just to wrap up, mothers, just, just uh, be moms according to the Bible. Margaret Dyson made a great statement. She said, not society's definition of a mother or an expectation of a mother. When that definition and expectation is contrary to God's plan and example of mothering and the reality of being a Christian mother in a non-Christian world. So let just, just be a mother uh, of the Bible. And, and so I'm going to wrap this up by trying to apply what I read in Philippians 3 uh, because I do think one of the biggest challenges that mothers face today is, is the loss of value of being a mother. You know, we're, we're, we're told that women who build their careers and are accomplished, society praises them in society and the whole idea of, of women trying to break ceilings. I don't know why you want to try to break a ceiling. First of all, that ain't good on your head. But, 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 but why try to break a ceiling to say that you've accomplished something as if accomplishing something is what you get your praise and glory in? Did y'all, are y'all all right? And, and so, but those who choose to stay home and place value on raising their children are looked down upon culturally as if they're less than other women. So I'm going to tell you this, the ultimate end for every one of us, including you mothers, is to glorify God. To glorify God in the manner that he's gifted you and designed you to be by the creator. You... You might be tempted to find glory, and buckle up on this, you may be tempted to find glory in being uh, in godly motherhood. Matter of fact, you may hear people tell you things like motherhood is the highest calling or raising godly children is the most important work. I totally disagree with that. I totally disagree with that, and I'm going to tell you why. Those kind of things actually miss the point because if that's the case, if the ultimate purpose of you as a woman, is to raise godly children, what happens when your children are grown? Is your purpose done? Or if the ultimate purpose of you as, as, a, as, a, as a mother is to raise children in the Lord, what if your child never comes to the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Is your purpose done? Are you, have you not fulfilled a godly purpose? Marquia makes a statement. I don't think she made it. Certainly wasn't making in line of this because she didn't know where I was going to go with the sermon. But, but she said something here that launches into where I'm going to end this. She said that it's been shown to be true for working moms and stay-at-home moms. We become overwhelmed and exhausted and trying to fill a void or become something that we may not have been created to be or to carry. When we acknowledge how and why God created mothers, we will walk in harmony in his good and perfect will for our lives. And so I do believe godly motherhood, obviously, I'm just, I'm teaching on it, is valuable. But it's not your first purpose. And it's not your first calling. As a matter of fact, this is what I know. As you pursue the, gl pursue the glory of God in your life and make that first, godly motherhood is the overflow. Godly motherhood is the overflow. When you find value, identity, and purpose in your relationship with Jesus, all this other stuff flows out of it. Paul said this, that everything that he had, everything that he had gained was of so great surpassing worth. That's what we read in, in Philippians 7. But he came to the point that any of that that he could boast about, brag about, write home about, tell everybody about, stand proudly on the stage about... All of that he considered, he considered it of nothing. The greatest thing for him, he says, was developing a relationship with Jesus. The most important thing. Motherhood is not meant to give us life. It's meant to point us to the true life giver. Point us to the true life giver. And so challenges will come. I think those things, even as a mother, is, is designed to draw us closer to Jesus. The scripture says Jesus suffered. And in his suffering, he experienced the power of the resurrection. I think the suffering and the challenges of motherhood is designed to take you to the same place. To take you to that place with Jesus where you trust in the power of God to give you life and to give you power. So that you can do what God has called you to do. The Westminster Catechism says the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. We glorify God when we know him. When we love him. 
when we absolutely surrender our lives to him. Motherhood is just one part of that pursuit. The ultimate pursuit is to enjoy a relationship with Jesus. And when you have trials, when you have tasks as a mother, they're going to draw you the pain, maybe the challenges. They're going to draw you closer and closer to the Lord, deeper and deeper in a relationship with Jesus. And you'll learn to rest in the power of God that will propel you through all those daily rhythms of being a mother and deepen your love for Jesus and the sacrifices that you got to make. Instead of it bringing glory to you, it'll bring glory to the Lord. And so dependence on God always will draw us deeper with him. So don't wrap up your purpose in life and just raising children alone. You shouldn't do that with any relationship. But when we keep our focus on knowing God better, all other things, all other pursuits, all other circumstances that God helps us with is out of that natural outflow. You are more than just your mother's child. You are a child of God. You're a woman of God. And your purpose of of motherhood is to know him, to love him better, to trust his strength. God made you to be part of the story for your children's life, but ultimately you're part of God's story. And I'm telling you, you can be happy, you can be godly, you can be gifted, you can do all that God called you to do if you just deepen that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? I think I'm done, if that's all right. Uh, I do have, if you, yeah, prayer team come and worship team come. Now, at the end of this sermon, that's why I want you to text me. I I have some prayers on here, wonderful prayers. Uh, Amanda Mellon, Marquia, Sopezia, Alicia, uh, Hancock, uh, Shana Stuckey, Desiree, Jolene, Christina Rooks. They're all part of this. I'm, I'm not... But I want you to see them, and I think they're wonderful prayers that you can pray over your children each day. So if you email me at Pastor Tyrone at ctcfamily.com, I'll get you all of this, and you'll have a gift coming uh, to your house. I, I, I just want everybody to stand. Um, I don't know how I'm going to wrap this up. I did tell you about Jesus. I told you he died on the cross for all our sins, and even you today can be saved and glorify God. So I think I'm going to wrap this up. We always have the altars open. You can come anytime and for prayer, whatever you may need. But if, you, if, you're, if you're next to a, uh, a woman, I, I, I want to, now you notice, and it's, it's, of course it's tough to do this. I know for some people Mother's Day is tough because this might be the first service you've been in since you lost your mom. For some it's, it's hard because even if it was a while ago, you may still miss your mother and Mother Day, Mother's Day is hard for you. Some may even, it may be tough because you're having a strange relationship with your mother or maybe never really knew your mom. There's some of you in here who desire to be a mother. And unfortunately, not yet has that been a gift that God has given you. I, I get it. There's all kind of thoughts and emotions that happen uh, with, with motherhood and being a child, being a, a daughter. And so I think I'm going to just close out with this. If you're, if you're comfortable and you're near someone that is a woman. It might be a grandmother, it might be an aunt, it might be a mother, it may not even be somebody you know, but if, they're, if, if, you're, if you're comfortable, just touching that person maybe on the shoulder, somewhere where you feel safe. I just wanna pray for all women in the house and just let the Holy Spirit do his thing. I, I'm not gonna hit every point, not gonna hit every issue, but the Lord knows the Holy Spirit can do what only the Holy Spirit can do. I want you to know the Lord loves you. We love you. We're grateful for you. We're cheering for you. We're cheering for you. We we want you to be the best woman that God has gifted you and created you to be, whatever aspect of life that that is. And I do want the things that I've shared to soak in. Father, uh, there's there's women all over this building from various aspects of life. Some, Lord God, are mothers. Some are not. Some, Lord God, uh, may be one day they desire to be. Some, Lord God, may, may be emotional because of whatever relationship they have with their mother or don't have. Some may be emotional because this is the first time they've hit Mother's Day without their mom. Lord, you know you're able to minister to them in whatever manner they need to be ministered to. And by your grace, let today still be a wonderful day for them. A wonderful day for them. Lord, I do pray 
for every mom at the sound of my voice that are raising children even today, children in their home. I'm certainly not going to say that everything I said here was perfect and maybe people got to filter through how some of that was said. But God, you know my heart's desire is for every mother in this house to be a mother that, mother that honors you and glorifies you in all that they do. And so, Lord, that's my prayer for every mother here. Those, Lord God, who, who heard and the Spirit is ministering to or convicting them of some things, let them respond to the conviction of the Spirit and make any decisions, any choices, any actions that's needed that they may indeed align with what you're calling them to do. But, Lord, I do pray that every mother in here feels celebrated, that they've had a great opportunity as a woman to be gifted by God to bring life into this world that they've been given a glorious responsibility to love and to nurture and to cherish and to represent you to that child. And I pray that they do it better from this day on than they've ever done it before.